Welcome to Heritage Church. We're so glad you've joined us for service today as we come together to worship our eternal and personal God. Heritage Church is a body of believers committed to honoring our Father, obeying His Holy Spirit, and loving like Jesus Christ. We are believing for a great move of God in our hearts, our church, and in our community around us. Now, are you ready to worship? Let's stand together as one church and lift up an offering of praise to our God. It is our prayer that we all came here this morning expecting an encounter with God's Holy Spirit because it's here this morning. Yeah. 
This is a holy moment. Let's open our hearts to Him today. This is a holy moment. Let's sing it twice more. Can we do that? This is a holy moment. Let's do it one more time. Open our hearts to God this morning. This is a holy moment. Amen. Where would you be this morning without God's saving grace? Without the symbol that's behind me, you would have no purpose to be here, but he sent his son to give you a chance at eternal life. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness. If it
Won't you sing this last chorus with us again? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood, you bought my freedom. Oh, hallelujah for the cross. Amen and amen. Well, welcome to the service today. It's so great to be with you and always such a unique opportunity. Did you ever think about this? Every single time we gather, we are a unique body of Christ, never to probably be repeated again. All these same people in this same room, and here we are during this holy moment that is worth celebrating this morning. We want to open up the altars before we go to uh, the third song, or as we go to the third song, I, I should say. Let's remember, it's not the altar of judgment, right? The altar is a place where needs are met where people's burdens are heard and where brothers and sisters in Christ get to share those. That's a neat thing. Let's go to God together this morning in a quick prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for this holy moment and the fact that you think enough of us to send your spirit here to be with us. And certainly it's thick and we feel it this morning. We ask you to continue to be with the rest of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue the song service this morning. i 
chance this morning in the senior high Sunday school class to pull apart a couple of verses in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, and Paul just simply communicates that, you know, I came with you not with some eloquent speech, with all the wisdom that I needed, but I've come knowing this. Know the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and the power that is represented by that. To think about what we just sang and have sung over the course of just being here this morning, the remembrance of I was once, and then we fill in the blank because of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. as we approach our prayer time this morning, I just encourage you, pray with me. Thanking God for the work that he's done in us. Thanking God for the daily power that he gives us to witness for him. Maybe there's somebody this morning that needs to respond to that invitation that God is drawing you to himself. He's saying, respond to the message. There's power in it. So as we pray, Pray knowing that you're praying to the living God. God, we thank you so much this morning for your goodness, your mercy, your touch. And God, we approach you thanking you so much for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope that it brings, the hope that it has. Lord, we've remembered this morning you brought us out of the sinful slave life that we were in. You called us forth from the bondage. And Lord, we praise you this morning. We thank you that you have freed us. God, we've responded to the light. God, we're thankful that we can use this terminology to help us understand the spiritual work that you've done in us. Lord, we celebrate that this morning because we celebrate you, first of all. God, we choose to worship. We want to set our lives aside and we hand over things and we choose just to say yes to you. God, help us in these moments where we get a chance to, again, see your expression what the Spirit of God shows forth. God, may you speak through Pastor Justin this morning. May you continue to use these moments, as it's been mentioned, as a body of believers to show forth your gifts to communicate this message to the world. Your message of love. God, we thank you this morning. Continue to change us continue to empower us. And Lord, we are thankful that we get a chance to love you because yes, you have first loved us. God, we pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus this morning and in the power of the Spirit, knowing that you continue to equip us to communicate your message and the message of the cross. And that God, we pray these things in your amazing name. Today at Heritage Church. Welcome to all our first time guests. Be sure to stop at the visitor center in the lobby today for a free gift. We hope you will choose Heritage as your church home. Here's a few highlights coming up. Serve Week is coming soon. If you would like more information on how to get involved, please sign your insert in your bulletin and place in the offering. Stop by our church booth at the Fayette County Fair tomorrow through Saturday. We would love to see you. The Friends Group is having a volleyball event on July 24th at 6 p.m. Please let Justin or Angela Seiler know if you will need childcare. Our school luncheon event is coming soon. Please sign up in the lobby if you can help. There's still time to get involved with sponsoring a child for the Miami Trace Backpack Program. Check out this informative video from Pastor Crystal and Danielle Seymour.
Hello, church family. Uh, I'm here with Danielle, and we just wanted to talk a little bit about the Miami Trace Backpack Program. Uh, I understand, um, Danielle, that this we're going into our sixth year yes, of this right. ministry. Uh, so tell me a little bit about what this ministry does. So what we do is we provide um, food that will help sustain the children over the weekend. Um, after speaking with staff um, at Miami Trace, we found that there was a great need. Um, a lot of these kids were going without food over the weekend. Um, so what we do is we try to send some easy to eat items that way a child as young as kindergarten is able to um, prepare it and eat it. But just helps get them through the weekend. That's wonderful. And this is for the elementary age kids, correct? Correct, yes. Awesome. And so basically um, a teacher like brings that name to you, uh, someone they recommend yes. for this because they know that there's a need there. Yes, okay. that's, that's correct. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, and so how many weeks does this run during the school year? So it is a 36-week school year, um, and we currently serve anywhere from 80 to 100 students each week. Each week. Okay. That's yes. amazing. Um, and I love the fact that um, we are meeting the felt needs of these kids. Um, the worst thing would be to be hungry on the weekend. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that's just, that breaks my heart. So I'm really glad that um, this was started five years ago. Yeah. Um, and it's my understanding that uh, the Jesus birthday offering that we took in December, um, 5,000 of that went to the backpack program that helped them get through the, the last school year. Yes, correct. Okay, so now we're getting ready for this school year. And uh, I understand in the past that we had some uh, corporate sponsors that kind of sponsored this program, um, and we don't have that yet. Yes. So we're praying for that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so we had some corporate sponsors here locally that pretty much have carried us up until last year. And we've had a few private donations given. Um, but this is the first school year that we've gone in without having the majority of the, the funding already covered. Okay. So yes, okay. There, there's a great need. Okay. So approximately how much does it cost to sponsor one kid for the year? So it's approximately $110. That's roughly $3 per child per week. Okay, so. very good. Well, congregation, we just wanted to bring this need to you to pray about. Um, this is obviously something that's impacting the children of our community every weekend during the school year. Um, so if God lays it upon your heart to sponsor a child or maybe more than one, uh, you would place that in the offering uh, to Heritage Church, I believe, yes. and then Heritage would, would give the money towards yeah. it. Okay. Correct, just mark it for the backpack program. Wonderful. And I think it's important too that um, folks know that all of this is volunteer work. So literally every penny that you give goes directly to purchasing the food for the kids. I love that. So I'm really glad that we have uh, parents as yourself and others who have a heart for this community. And um, this is just something that um, we really want to give our support to. So. Um, yeah. One other thing too, I know people have often asked about Courthouse City Schools. And um, Grace Methodist Church provides, they serve um, the backpack program for Courthouse. So that's why that's we, we only take care, we focus on Miami Trace. That's wonderful. So, yeah. Okay, so congregation, just pray about this need. Um, if you would like to sponsor a child, you would place that in the offering. Um, if you have any other questions, contact Danielle at the church office. She'd be glad to answer those questions for you. And we thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the ministries of Heritage Church. You can give online at heritagewch.com. You can give at the giving kiosk in the lobby. You can text the number down below. You can write a check or give cash. And now you can also give on the cash app at dollar sign heritage WCH. We pray that God will bless you. We are so blessed that you are here today. Let's join together with Pastor Justin and study God's word. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew! Matthew, son of Alpheus! Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes. You. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're gonna throw it all away. chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. I can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Amen. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to next. And as you're turning there, welcome. Good morning. Glad you're here with us in the room. And those of you watching online, wherever you may be, glad that you've chose to join us this morning. Verse 18 in Matthew chapter 4 says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now in the book of Hebrews... It says that Jesus was the same, or is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So, if he calls his followers to come follow me back then, he calls us today to come follow him in the same way, right? And we want to respond to that calling, don't we? Don't we? Don't we? Yes, of course we do. We want to respond to that calling. Most of us have probably prayed that prayer, Lord, I want to follow you. We've probably sang that. Uh, Chris Tomlin song where you go I'll go I will follow you we all want to respond to the calling of Jesus on our lives right but there's one very important question that we don't ask very often and that's where's he going you ever think about that Jesus is saying hey come follow me where are you going because if I'm serious about following someone, I want to know where they're going. Because if you mean business with your commitment, you're going to end up where that person's going to end up. That person's destination will become your destination. It's kind of like when I met my wife for the first time. She was introduced to me. I saw her and that beautiful smile and that pretty curly hair. And I said, there is none like you. No one else. No, I'm just kidding. She immediately rolled her eyes. That's not true. But I felt it in my heart. But when I saw her, I liked what I saw. Guys, do you remember when you saw your wife for the first time? You probably liked what you saw, amen? But did you ask her to marry you that day? No. Why? Because you didn't know her. I didn't know Angela. What I did know of her, I liked, but I didn't know her destination. I didn't know where she was headed, but once we did get to know each other and realized, I like where you're going, and she liked where I was going, so we were like, hey, let's, let's go together. So we decided to follow Jesus together as a married couple through this life. So the big question for you and me as Jesus is saying, follow me, is where is he going? Where will we end up if we are serious about following him? Well, thankfully, there's one chapter in the Bible, Luke 15, that gives us the answer to this question. 
And Luke 15 basically contains three parables right in a row, one one after another. And that's the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So I'm going to read the first two parables, and I'm just going to sum up the third one because it's a little bit longer. But in Luke 15, starting in verse 4, it says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then follows the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Most of you have heard the story. There's one father, two sons. One son wants his inheritance early. Father gives it to him. He goes off, squanders it on sinful living. Um, Ends up a filthy mess, poor, hungry. He decides to, to go back to his father and beg for forgiveness. And maybe he can just come back as one of his servants and not even a son. So he does. But while he's still far away, the father was looking for him. He saw him, and he went to him. And he fully restored him to the point where the brother who was in the right place got a little jealous of the brother who was in the wrong place of all the attention he was getting because he came back home. So let's analyze these three parables. In all three of these parables, there's things in common. One, there's something that's in the wrong place. Then there's something in the right place. And then there's someone representing God. So let's look at the lost sheep. Who's the shepherd? That's God, right. Jesus is the shepherd. The 99 are in the right place. But there's one sheep that's not where he's supposed to be. He's in the wrong place. Then the second parable, we have God represented by the woman. There's one coin in the wrong place. And then there's nine others in the right place. And then finally, the third parable of the prodigal son. God is represented by the father. And there's one son in the wrong place and one son in the right place. Now, the big point Jesus is trying to make by telling these three parables, one right after another, he keeps emphasizing the same point over and over and over again. Which one of these two categories gets God's attention? Hmm? The lost. Every single time. So number one, the story of the shepherd, the shepherd's full focus is that one sheep that's in the wrong place. Even if that sheep is in the minority, the shepherd leaves the 99 in the wilderness. Now that's, that's a crazy thing to me because if I was a shepherd, and thank goodness I'm not, but if I was a shepherd and I had 100 and lost one, I would have been like, I still got 99. It's not too bad, right? Could have been worse. I'll just keep a closer eye on these 99 I got left, and I'll let that one worry about himself. But thank goodness I'm not the shepherd. Because the heart of the shepherd in this story, he cannot stand the thought that there would be one single sheep under his care that he loves that would be lost out in the wilderness. So he leaves the 99. That's you and me who are here every week. He leaves the 99, and he goes out to seek and to save that which is lost. Second parable, the woman's woman's attention is fully on what? The one lost coin. She sweeps the house and lights the lamp, fully focused on getting back that which was lost. And finally, the third parable, the father's focus is on the lost son. How do we know that? Because it says in, this, in the Bible, when he returned while he was far off, the father saw him. Meaning the father was looking for his return. He was waiting, hoping that lo- that lost son would come back. So the point Jesus is trying to make is this. 
His attention is always focused on that which is lost. Luke 19 tells us the whole reason Jesus came to earth is this. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to what? To seek and to save the lost. What are we doing? Are we seeking and saving the lost? He's going to find the lost sheep and the lost son and the lost coin. And on his way to that which is lost, he turns and his eyes meet mine and his eyes meet yours. And he says, come, follow me. Follow me, not just to church on Sundays, but follow me to find that lost sheep, that one lost coin, to bring home and welcome home that one lost son or daughter. Because I was once that lost son. And thank God, he came to me and said, come, follow me. And I thank God I did. So let's go back to these two men that we read about initially in Matthew chapter 4. One of them was called Peter, and he went on to follow Jesus, but later on in his life, at a time when Jesus was arrested, Peter made an adjustment in the way he followed Jesus. Matthew 26, 58 says this, but Peter followed him at a distance. Right up to the courtyard of the high priest, he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. Peter makes the mistake of allowing a distance in his following. See, technically, he's still following Jesus, but he's just following a little bit further back than he was before. And if you read this chapter later on, you'll see how some people have started coming up to Peter. Hey, aren't you with, aren't you with this Jesus guy? Weren't you one of his followers? And repeatedly, over and over, he says, no. No, no, I don't even know the man, and he calls down curses on him. But what we see here is that when we allow a distance in our following of Jesus, it starts to affect our relationships with others around us. See, when we allow a distance, we start turning inward, and it starts to once again become all about us and our comfort and our security and our preferences instead of being all about the lost like Jesus was but now Peter after he calls down curses his whole goal is his own comfort and security at this point he's willing to do or say anything that will save his own skin but praise God after the resurrection Jesus fully restores Peter and immediately boom it becomes about not him anymore and saving his own skin, it becomes all about the lost people again and reaching that lost sheep, that lost coin, or welcoming home that lost son or daughter. He was all about the lost sheep. I want to close today by uh, sharing a story. You all have heard of the uh, Titanic? You ever heard of that ship before? Yeah, I figured most of you probably have. A lot of you have heard many stories, probably seen the movie. Um, but there was a story that I came across in the last couple of weeks that I'd never seen before, and I thought this fit the point I was trying to make pretty well, so I thought I'd share it. So the Titanic, just to review, to review, back when it was built, it was the largest man-made object in the world at the time. So it was traveling on its one and only voyage from England to New York City. It had over 2,200 people on board, and it was sailing or sailing or whatever, floating through whatever ships do. They don't sail, they float. It was going across the Atlantic. There we go. And it hit an iceberg. And this ship was massive, so it took a while for this massive ship to sink. So from the time it hit the iceberg till it actually disappeared underwater, it was about three and a half hours. There was a lot of time to get into the lifeboats. But the strange thing is that when you look at the story of the Titanic disasters, uh, disaster, the lifeboats that were lowered into the ocean during that first hour, see, mo- the, the lifeboats had a capacity on the Titanic of 70 people. Well, they looked at the passenger logs for the first hour, and every lifeboat that went out, 
it had between 12 and 30 people on it. So they were half full, like, all right, go, go. So as you can imagine, once the boat went all the way down, you had all these half full or half empty lifeboats floating in the water with all these hundreds and hundreds of people in the water outside of the lifeboats. And this is where what they call the second tragedy of the, of the Titanic happened. All of the lifeboats, except for one, they saw the people floating in the water, crying out for them to save them or to help them. But they, they chose to row away. They all rowed away from the disaster. Can you imagine sitting in your half full lifeboat, lifeboat and seeing all these people treading water, hoping they're going to make it. I got plenty of room. All I got to do is row over there and pick them up. But no, they, they willfully turned and went the other way. There was only one lifeboat out of all those lifeboats that actually turned around and went back to pick up survivors. John Harper was a guy that was on the Titanic. He was a 39-year-old Scottish evangelist. He was on the Titanic so that he could get over to Chicago where he was going to preach to hundreds and hundreds of people. So on his trip, he brought his little girl, Annie Jessie Harper, and that's her on his lap, and that's him and his wife. She was only six years old when they were on the Titanic. But Annie, Jesse, and John were one of the first people on the boat to realize that something was wrong. And we know this because Annie, Jesse, his daughter, was one of the first people registered to be put on one of those first lifeboats, but not John. See, the story from the witnesses um, says that Harper came up with his daughter. He held on to her for a few seconds, kissed her forehead, and he looked at her. And he said, I'll see you sometime later, honey. I love you so much. He put his daughter in the lifeboat, made sure she was well taken care of as the lifeboat was lowered. I, I, I can't imagine doing that. Because I got two little girls. And uh, I can't imagine putting them on that lifeboat knowing that's probably the last time I'm going to see him this side of heaven. But John Harper's love for the lost outweighed his desire to want to be with his daughter in that moment. Because his, his thinking was that well, if, if I die tonight or, or, you know, heaven forbid my little girl dies tonight, we know where we're going but there's hundreds and hundreds of people on this ship who don't know Jesus. And if they die tonight, they're gonna to be separated from God for eternity. And John Harper couldn't live with that. He knew that now was the time for him to start following Jesus to where he was actually going, to find a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son and daughter. He started running around the ship pounding on the cabin doors. Now, I've heard this before. Women and children to the lifeboats. You've heard that before, right? Women and children, get to the lifeboats. But John Harper added one more category. He said, women, children, and people who don't know Jesus, get to the lifeboats now. Women, children, and anyone who does not know Jesus, because he could not live with the fact of knowing that someone could die tonight and spend an eternity away from Jesus. And all around him, John Harper, he, there's these lifeboats getting lowered, and he, would have, he could have hopped on any single one of those, and we wouldn't have blamed him a bit, would we? But he didn't. He just kept pounding on doors, seeking that one more lost son, daughter, sheep, coin. John Harper ended up being one of the hundreds floating in the water that night and realizing that he was in the water and he, he saw the lifeboats rowing away and he knew this was probably his final moments. He started changing his battle cry. 
So just imagine treading water, open ocean, knowing you're, you're probably going to meet Jesus at any moment. And all he could do was he kept yelling out, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. And there's witnesses that testify over the screams and at crying of help and agony and anguish. There was this one single solitary male voice in the midst of all that saying, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. About a year after the Titanic disaster, there was a survivor's reunion and one of the first people to come up and give his testimony at the survivor's reunion was a guy, what was his name? Um, William John Mellers. And he said he was only 19 years old at the time the Titanic went down, but I was one of the many hundreds who ended up in the water that night. I still remember, he said, holding on to a piece of debris, trying to make it, but realizing I'm going to die tonight before my life has even begun. But then he shared that the current brought him close to a man later identified as John Harper. And this man looked at the 19-year-old and shouted to him, Do you know Jesus? And William wasn't expecting that kind of question in that moment, so he didn't say anything. He was just kind of shocked. So the current brought him away. And so he's treading water, holding on to that piece of debris, thinking about what this man just asked him. And then just a few minutes later, they come back together. And John looks at him again. Do you know Jesus yet? <laughs> and finally, he had enough sense to, to answer. He says, no, honestly, sir, I can't say that I do. Well, once again, the current separated him, and that was the last time that anyone saw John Harper alive. William John Mellers, that 19-year-old, gave his life to Jesus right there in that ocean. And just minutes later, he was picked up by the only lifeboat that came back. And a year later at the survivor's reunion, this guy shares his testimony and he ended it by saying, I was saved twice that night. Isn't that a cool story? So here we are, a perfect picture of the two versions of Christianity we see in our world today. We've got the one version where we're in our half full lifeboat, content and happy that we're saved but not willing to row out to those who are treading water and desperately need some help. Or we can be like the John Harpers of our generation and realizing that now is the time to follow Jesus where he's really going. Meaning giving our all, giving our best to reaching out and not looking inward so much, but looking outward to those who haven't met Jesus yet. Because I don't know about you, but I remember when I was lost. Do you? I'm so thankful that Jesus came and said, come, follow me. And don't we want to offer that same opportunity to others that are lost right now, just like we were? I think sometimes that the, the longer we've been a Christian, we tend to forget what it was like before we were saved. And my prayer is that God would just help us to remember what it was like, how hopeless, how much we were searching and realizing there's countless thousands and thousands of others out there that are feeling the same way right now. And we've got a half empty lifeboat. I don't know about you, but I want mine full when I finally reach that heavenly shore. What about you? Are we happy with our lifeboats being half full or do we want to pack them out? I want to pack mine out. So would you stand? And as we close with this final song, um, maybe you just need to recommit. Maybe you've been following Jesus and and 
if you've been like me at times, sometimes I can tend to start focusing inward and my, my own preferences and comfort and, and, and security, and, and we start to lose sight on the main thing, the main thing, why Jesus came here to begin with, to seek and to save the lost, what he calls us to do as his followers, to go make disciples, to save and reach that lost son or daughter, that lost coin or that lost sheep. So if that's you, if you just want to recommit, you can pray where you're at, you can come forward and pray, however the Lord's leading you. Or maybe you're like Peter when Jesus got arrested and you've allowed a, a distance in your following. I mean, you're still a Christian, you're still following after him, but maybe not quite as closely as you were a couple years ago. And you want to start today. Let's start today by closing that gap. By taking a step towards him and shortening that distance that we've created between our following. Or maybe you've never followed Jesus ever. You're here, maybe for the first time, and you just feel a tug on your heart. Well, let me tell you, that tug to Jesus, he wants nothing more than to love you and to have a relationship with you. And if that's you, I invite you to come especially. You can pray where you're at. You can come forward at the altar and pray. However the Lord's leading you, you, you be obedient to him as we close with this song. Great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke a man into And to the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. You could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory to is broken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my Christ, my living hope, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for how you're moving in our hearts and in this place. Lord, I thank you for those who have come forward. Lord, would you fill them with your presence? Give them the peace and strength they need to do whatever it is that you're calling them to do. And God, as we leave this place, may we follow you. Not just the church, not just the Bible study, but Lord, to, to where you're truly going. 
Lord, you're still calling people to come follow you. And Lord, we want to respond to that with your help. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, Jake and Kenzie. Amen. Yes, give the Lord a, give the Lord a hand. You're allowed. As the ushers make their way to the front, and we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offerings, uh, a few quick, quick reminders. Uh, we're going to have a fair booth this year once again Woo-hoo! at the Fayette County Fair. So if you're there and you need a break from the heat, you can come on into the Mayhan building where it's nice and cool and find us at the booth and be sure to say hi, okay? Let's pray for the offering. Father, thank you so much for the way that you bless us. And Lord, we acknowledge everything we have is from you. And we just want to, as an act of worship, return back to you what was already yours to begin with. And we just ask that you bless it, Lord, and use it for your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we've got the fair coming. Be praying for our teens. They will be going to their Hollow Rock Youth Camp this Thursday for 10 days. So pray for the students, but not only for the students, be praying for Pastor John and Jody and all their helpers. That is a huge undertaking, but they have seen so much spiritual fruit from that. And I know it's because partly of how you pray for these kids when they're down there. So continue to do that. God really moves in the lives and hearts of kids in church camp. And even on 25 and 26 year olds at their first church camp, like he did me. So with that being said, would you all stand, turn to someone, tell them you love them and have a great week. God bless.